so this is where we need the audience kind of participation in our discussion. So kind of <laughs> thinking about the philosophy that Christine just pre presented, you know, this person serve. If you could just take a minute to maybe turn to the person next to you around your table to discussion and think about in your area of practice, who would be the person or person served and, and whether or not you do obtain input from them, either through your accreditation process or those of you that are you know, working in other areas of practice. So, because we want to make sure as we're thinking about this framework, um, how does this work that CARF does could translate to our own work. So. So real quickly, and then we'll ask you uh, to shout out kind of at the, as you get this put out, some examples. Good person discussion. Hard to put it into practice. All right. So if we could just hear real quickly, what what are some conversations you had on the table about person served? Get some input. Oh come on. I just yell. Okay. It, it wasn't really so much in our group, but I just want to say I am so excited with the word person. I just have to applaud you because <laughs> we have to change our language. We really do, and so thank you. You're welcome. Yes. So um, we actually have multiple uh, persons served, and part of that process is to often... Uh, we, we routinely survey students, educators, employers, um, and our board members as well. And the, the, the value of that is to be able to compare and contrast perspectives so that you can actually generate discussion in terms of the different perspectives that come out as part of that process. We routinely um, attend events that those groups um, host, uh, so we're a guest, uh, but we we um, use that as an opportunity for Q and A as well as up updating process as well. 
Can I? Oh, yeah, oh. I, I have a question for you. <clears throat> when you have these events, then um, do you have practical examples that you would give to your accreditor who is coming to show what you've done with the information that you've received from those stakeholders? So it might be a change in curriculum. It might be adding new uh, clinical internship or affiliation sites. So do you have some practical use of that information? Um, yes, we actually use it to determine uh, we're the National Council of State Boards, which is the, the overarching body that supports the state regulatory authorities. Okay. So the data that we get from that actually structures the content dimensions of the examination processes that students have to pass before they can get a license. So it's a very, very uh, direct and uh, open uh, process in terms of this is how it's changed over time. Uh, as a result of this, we're seeing uh, more need to put emphasis on X, Y, and Z, okay. and, and that actually uh, translates into a change. Good. Good. Maybe one other example, just because of our time, Pam. Mine's a practice example. I, I serve on a hospital board in Northern Virginia, and they take patient data very seriously. And there's dashboards, there's percent of response rate, there's goals, how you're trying to improve over one year, three years. And I admire that. They're, they're listening. But of course, things go public, too, within that sector. So I just wanted to let you know. And we would expect transparency. And our we've had what was originally called program evaluation since 1973 in standards. <clears throat> and everyone on the person serve side has to measure in four key domains. Effectiveness, which is a direct result of services. Efficiency, which is how many resources does it take you to achieve that result. So you could be really effective and totally inefficient. You can be really efficient and totally ineffective. Access, so do people get what they need when they need it, and then satisfaction or input. And we always ask for two perspectives, one from the person served and one from a stakeholder group. So the transparency of that, our standards require that you share information about your actual performance <clears throat> with the person served, with personnel, and with stakeholders. So there's transparency as well that you would expect to have in that. Okay, great. All right, so um, unfortunately we only have like 10 minutes, so we'll have to um, kind of capture these last part pieces up very quickly. But what would you say have been the <clears throat> opportunities associated with this person-centered philosophy? Well, the opportunity is that you can actually hear what consumers are saying about services and use that as performance improvement. So our surveyors, because it's a consultative process, they can embed that into the feedback that they give during the actual on-site survey. It's also critical that when we're looking at the opportunity to change our standards as well. And so with our standards, consumers have to be there and not professional consumers, consumers who are actually receiving services. And our process of developing and revising standards is two and a half days. So this is not a year or two years or three years. Our process is very slick. It involves field um, input. It involves field review, review by an international advisory council, and that's always that focus on the person served and that those standards reflect that. And so the opportunities for us are boundless from what we hear from our surveyors and what they're um, bringing back through the process. We have the opportunity to also um, take a look at improving services through different partnerships and collaborations we have with our stakeholders. We're just entering into a partnership where we're taking evidence-based research and turning them into practice guidelines through work that we're doing with a collaboration of providers who are uh, looking at those educational and scientific reviews. So we feel that through our work, through our survey process, our surveyors, and also our work with our collaborative partners that we end up enhancing the life of that individual who's being served in our accredited programs. So what then would you say have been the challenges associated? Oh, well, um, we're working with a group of professionals. And so egos, uh, <laughs> probably egos uh, sometimes uh, get in the way of things. Um, we, we do a lot of uh, feedback. So um, if you were going to go through one of our surveys, you would give feedback on us and our work with you to get you ready for the survey. You would give feedback on the surveyors. 
you would give feedback on the value of our process. And then the surveyors give feedback on the organization as well as their fellow teammates. And one of the things that we find the challenge is the person who comes in and, well, this is how I do it. Uh, this is how you need to do it. Uh, the lack of interest in par having the participation with the person served, uh, feedback that there was only one person interviewed, which is not what, how we train. Uh, the challenge is always making sure that people understand why we exist, and it's to protect the person who is served in those programs. And that is our passion, and that's what we're about. So the challenge is how do you give that passion and that interest to everyone who's got a thousand other things that they're doing because our people work in accredited programs. So they're only are doing a survey for us at a minimum three times a year. And so how do you make sure that they go out and they're an ambassador for us to be able to be focused on, did this program make a difference for these individuals? Is there durability of that result as well? And that's the other thing that you need to think about, the challenge of how do we know there's a durable result with our education? We ask our providers to do follow-up and take a look at the durability of what they've done. I can get someone independent from admission to discharge but if they go home and three months later they're sitting in the lazy boy recliner and haven't left and are not doing anything for themselves, did rehab make a difference? No, it didn't. And that's what we need to be focused on. So the challenge is dealing with all those things and making sure that people are prepared to really listen to the person served, make a difference in their life, and be able to have the skills to do that when they're doing an accreditation process or a survey. So what would be your top suggestions to us if we're thinking about a framework that could for accreditation for uh, all professions um, with this person-centered philosophy? I really um, think it's critical that people um, learn how to actively listen, be a dynamic listener, and get the story of the individual that they're working with. I always say that every young clinician needs to have an aha moment, and I'll share my aha moment. Uh, young OT, what do OTs love to do? Make sure that people are independent, right? And uh, I was in Palm Springs, which has a variety of different people. And I had a woman who the first day, let's get learn how to get dressed. She had had a stroke, and so she was very pleasant. And I noticed all her diamonds on her hand and didn't really, I talked to her and knew where she lived and all those things. Came up the next day, and she said, honey, I just love you. But, you know, I haven't dressed myself for 15 years. The maid does that. And it just kind of, I, I went, okay. So I said, well, what would you like to learn how to do? And she said, you know, I play bridge every single day, and I want to learn how to play cards one-handed because I need to get back to my bridge club because they're missing me. After that, I never, ever assumed anything about anyone's life, and I became a great listener for stories of what they told me and, you know, had interesting OT sessions, people learning how to open the whiskey bottle one-handed and things like that. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, you know, it's all that pinch and dexterity and all those things. But I think that's, that's the message that I would give you. How are you preparing all these individuals that you're working with to go out and really be dynamic and really be able to come into an organization as a new grad and the people go, oh my God, let's get people from this school because they are prepared. They know how to work efficiently. They know that we have productivity measures. We know that they can listen. I mean, if that was it, you'd never have a problem finding a clinical affiliation ever again if your grads were coming out and you could offer that to people. Uh, Chris, I mean, one of the things she shared with me is that her observation of a lot of our accreditation <laughs> process is very uh, paper focused and a lot of self-assessment. And, uh, and so I asked her, I said, do you do, like, do people submit like a self-study and document? She's like, oh, no, <laughs> we don't have that at all. So I don't know if you could just share a little bit of more about that, uh, because I think yeah. what you're talking about is a uh, just a totally different approach. Right, and I, I, had a, I have a real example because when we acquired the Continuing Care Accreditation Commission, it was based on an education model of accreditation. Um, and it has a five-year accreditation, which is not typical for health and human services and all those things. And I walked into an office that had all these boxes, and I went, what are these? Oh, these are the self-assessments. I went, okay, but who reads those? 
and uh, they said to me, oh, the evaluators. And I said, really? We ship these to them, and they read all of these. They're working full time. So that was one kind of observation. <laughs> I think um, we have a survey workbook that people can purchase. And they can ask all the questions of how are you going to show us how you're doing that. We, our people are trained to go in, and there's three tasks of a survey. There's interviewing, that's one-on-one -on -one and confidential. There's observation, because these are people who work in the same type of programs, and so they can observe and see what's happening. And then there are things that need to be in writing. The thing that we need to see in writing, we're asking them, our surveyors look at it, and then go talk to people. Because they're actually practices, or their policies, or procedures that you want everyone to know about. And if someone is a prolific, I'd say, obsessive compulsive policy writer, that's great. But if no one knows about it and it's sitting on a shelf in some dean's office, how do you know that it actually occurred if your a process doesn't include that, finding out what people are doing with these practices that they're supposed to be following? So we, we don't, our people are uh, people working in the field. They don't have time to be reading reams of paper. And so what if you read it? You have to see if it's practiced. You have to see if it's embedded. Because what we always say is accreditation is a process, and it's a snapshot in time when we come in to see where you are with that process. It is not an event. And most people prepare for it as an event. And we always say the only event is the party when the surveyors leave. That's the only event <laughs> you should plan for. Because this process, if it's not embedded into your day-to-day -day practice, what a waste of time and energy for all of you who are in institutional settings. It's a waste. Because if you're not using it every day, why do it? It has to be embedded into day-to-day -day practice. Otherwise, it's a to-do that people groan and moan, I'm sure. They're like every other group. And it's, oh, they're coming. They're coming. They're coming. That shouldn't be it. We should be prepared any day for someone to come and see our practices. All right. Well, um, so now I know we gave you a very quick overview of this person center philosophy, but very effective. And and I appreciate, Chris, your comments. But just your reaction, thoughts to how we could embed this or how it could inform a framework that could be used for the accreditation process. And I know we're right at the time, but just real quickly, we'll be all right if we just have a little bit of um, reaction to, to the philosophy that Chris has presented. I guess my main question is, would the DOE accept it? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's that's the problem. We're all under the DOE, right? Right. We have to do what they say. So how do you influence those individuals? How do you not close yourself off and say we're, somebody else is um, the influencer? How do you work with them to show them that the result might be better? So it's influencing. We have lots of stakeholders that we have felt in the past would not agree. Uh, and we have over 200 relationships with government agencies that accept accreditation. So that takes a lot of work. So Chris, help me understand. It sounds like this is more of an educational process and kind of an assurance process. It sounds like there's some assurance aspects of what you do. But it sounds like it's mostly trying to drive performance improvement. What happens if somebody doesn't meet your standards? How much of a stick is actually involved? Because, I mean, in looking at the ratings on these rehab centers, some of them actually are performing pretty poorly. You know, when you look at the CMS rankings. You have to rankings. tell me if they're CARF accredited, though. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's what I'm asking. So yeah. I, I, where do you fit within that schema? Um, first of all, um, the stick would be for those that are under a mandated situation where their payment depends upon CARF accreditation. Otherwise, we would never... Um, we would never call CARF accreditation a stick. It is a performance improvement model. We do have various outcomes of our accreditation. The highest award is a three-year. There's a one-year, and there's a non-accreditation. There's a provisional accreditation, which is a second one year in, the, in a row, which puts them on notice the third time that they would go through a survey. If they weren't at a three-year level, they would be non-accredited. Because it is a quality improvement process, we would expect them to be able to move forward. They have a quality improvement plan that they must submit to us. And if you have a three-year accreditation, there's an annual conformance to quality report that is submitted. 
Um, we're available along the way to assist with them. We're, um, all the people who work at CARP in our specific areas have clinical backgrounds or backgrounds in the program so that they've used the standards themselves. So um, whether um, the performance on CMS, um, remember that a lot of those are not specific to rehabilitation. They're acute care hospitals, and we do units within acute care hospitals. We don't do the acute care hospital. So I, because I'm a shopper, I like to consider ourselves a boutique accreditation. So we do the specialty programs within large general acute care hospitals. We don't do the general acute care hospital. We leave that to DMV and Joint Commission and those groups. Any other questions? This is a great opportunity. Thank you so much for having me. I, anything that we can do to help, just let me know. And I, yeah, thank you.